Everybody, welcome to today's uh, Lab Corp session. This is our July 2023 uh, ECHO session. Uh, please note that we will have a 30 minute presentation followed by a question and answer session. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them onto the chat box and then we will deal with them after this session. Uh, there is simultaneous translation uh, fro from English to French and Portuguese. So please uh, log into the channel that uh, best suits you. Uh, today's session uh, will be led by Dr. Andrew Mujigira. Uh, Dr. Mujigira is a senior research scientist at Makerere University Infectious Disease Institute and affiliate as assistant professor of the global health at the University of Washington. He has 18 years of experience conducting HIV prevention clinical trials in East and Southern Africa. His research has supported evidence-based uh, policy changes at both global and also at the country level. He currently serves as a principal investigator and co-investigator of several NIH-funded uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis effectiveness trials, demonstration projects, and implementation studies among underserved and vulnerable key populations in Uganda. These projects are evaluating the use of combination HIV prevention tools like HIV self-testing, STI self-sampling, uh, PrEP, uh, and retroviral treatment with the goal of reducing HIV incidence. For today, he is going to talk to us uh, on his work on point of care uh, e EID and viral load and how the point of care and, and, uh, and, and can facilitate faster return of results uh, among patients and how that can also uh, help in terms of adherence uh, to treatment. So over to you, uh, Doc, for the presentation followed by questions and answer. My name is Colin Sotieno, I'm a project leader at ASLM, welcome. Thank you very much, Collins, for the kind introduction. It's an honor to present this work to ASLM. And this pilot randomized trial was conducted by Mercury University Infectious Diseases Institute in collaboration with University of Washington and Harvard University. On the call are my colleagues, research midwives Agnes Nachanzi and Faith Nadunga, who will help with the Q&A. So nearly all women who have HIV in Uganda who are pregnant receive treatment um, for HIV. But not all their babies receive an HIV test. Uganda AIDS Commission data released just before COVID show that about one third of babies do not receive an HIV test. And only about a quarter receive the final uh, antibody test at 18 months as recommended in the national guidelines. Depending on which source you look at, uh, transmission of HIV from mother to baby is about 2.8%. Um, if you go by the Minister of Health data, and it's lower if you go by PEPFAR data. And this is driven by mothers who get HIV when they're pregnant or while they're breastfeeding, moms who stop taking treatment after they're delivered knowing that they have a negative baby, and babies who do not get um, prophylaxis, never have been prophylaxis. So we were interested in testing viral order delivery because this is a population of women who are already at the clinic. They are mostly discharged within at least a day of delivery because as you know, we have space constraints. But you can get viral load results, point of care viral results within an hour and a half. And this may motivate mothers to continue treatment as we shall discuss later in the talk. It also enables us to address those that one third of babies who do not get an HIV test for various reasons. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, same day results may increase the coverage of early infant diagnosis, that's what EID stands for, and motivate mothers to breastfeed. So at the time we did the study, there were limited data on whether point of care viral load testing improved viral suppression among women who had HIV. And so the purpose of the study was to evaluate whether this testing 
with um, same-day adherence support improved viral suppression among women who are pregnant or who are just delivered compared to the standard of care lab testing that we are familiar with. The study was done and from between February 2021 and July 2022. This was just after COVID a lockdown had been lifted, but some restrictions were still in space, in place, I mean, with Uganda having one of the longest lockdowns in the world. We worked at a health center three on the western suburbs of Kampala, which is a primary healthcare facility. We enrolled pregnant women with HIV who are older than 18 and could consent and who had partners of unknown HIV status. Um, we randomized them to four groups using a factorial design, and we followed them until three months after delivery. For this study, blood samples were drawn by the research midwives. Typically, a mother came into the clinic and was received by a research midwife who drew the sample and then took it to the lab herself, handed it over to the lab tech, who then started running the assay. And the midwife used the 90 minutes the assay was being run to conduct research procedures so that the mother wouldn't have to wait a long time. An all point of care viral load testing was performed using the Cepheid expert HIV viral load test on the gene expert system, which was provided by Cepheid. So briefly, this was a pilot randomized trial in which we evaluated two interventions. One was for male partners to encourage them to test for HIV. And the second one was for the pregnant women to improve their ART adherence. For the purposes of this talk, I'm only going to focus on the female partner intervention. So we aim to enroll 200 women, randomize them to four arms. And for this talk, we shall combine arms one and two as standard of care, and arms three and four as a point of care viral load testing arms. I will not present data for men uh, in this talk. Uh, our analysis on it, as an intent to treat comparison, where we combined, as I said, uh, arms one and two, arms three and four. And then we also estimated uh, the probability of achieving viral suppression by the randomization arm. So these are the baseline data. We enrolled 151 women, 77 in the point of care viral load arm and 74 in the standard of care arm. Uh, women were 28 years, a median of 28 years, and most had at least a primary secondary school education. Nearly all were married and had been in the current partnership for at least three years. And importantly, about a third of them won polygamous partnerships. Um, which is, uh, been, as you know, a risk factor for HIV and other STIs. Men were at least six years older than women, and only one quarter of men partners had tested for HIV, as reported by the woman. Um, most had already had at least one child, and nearly all were taking HIV treatment at enrollment, 98%. Of these, um, 83% were undetectable. And here we're using the cutoff of less than 50 copies per meal. Um, the national guidelines follow WHO standards where the cutoff is less than 1,000 copies per meal. For those who had uh, detectable viral load above 50 copies per meal, the median detectable viral load was 225. So many of these would have been classified as detectable, undetectable using uh, WHO cutoffs. I would like you to note that only 40% of women had disclosed their status to their partners, meaning 60% had not disclosed. We shall discuss implications of that in a few minutes. Regarding pregnancy, most were live born and most were delivered vaginally. Um, we were not able to test about one third of babies. Um, in, in both arms because this study was done during COVID and during lockdown, mothers had relocated from the city to the villages and some decided to stay there until they delivered. Um, for those who were able to test, um, the time from delivery to the baby test was the same day, but with an IQR of zero to four days. 
compared to standard of care, which varied um, with a median of 97 days. Most were on ART when they came back for the postpartum visit. And we, the proportion of those who were suppressed in the viral load arm, testing arm was 89% versus 82% for the standard of care arm. With the median viral load of those for whom it was detectable still below 1,000 copies per mil. There were very few separations, uh, four in the intervention arm and eight in the standard of care arm. Our experience is working with couples affected by HIV is that separations are often due to reasons other than HIV. So to summarize, we found that at three months postpartum, 89% of women in the intervention arm versus 82% were suppressed. So this is not statistically significant. Um, we remember this was a small sample of only 151 women. So we'd have needed to see a much larger difference in viral suppression for it to be significant. And so the interpretation is that women randomized to point of care viral load testing were as likely to have undetectable viral load or viral suppression as women randomized to standard of care. So this is a summary of the quantitative results. But we also did some qualitative work to better understand how women and men and providers experience the intervention. And so for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus on 22 women who received point of care viral load testing who are purposefully sampled so that we can better understand the experience. Interviews were done by our local staff who are trained in qualitative methods, who recorded the interviews and transcribed them into English. So this was an implementation study, and so there were challenges that we would like to share. Nearly half of the mothers in a qualitative sample are de delivered at another health facility and not at the research uh, facility. And because of COVID-19, uh, this presented challenges for both mothers and, and implementing staff, that is the midwives and the lab staff. So this required doing home visits to collect blood samples for mothers who are delivered elsewhere. And this often meant that we collected the sample a few days after delivery, not just immediately after birth. So what we did was that the research staff called the mother for permission to conduct a home visit and to schedule an appointment. Then the mother was told that a technician, a lab tech, would travel to her home for the procedure. Most often the mother had, did not know the technician, at least she knew the midwife, but did not know the technician. So staff then told the technician about the home visit appointment. And then the technician called the mom, introduced themselves, confirmed that it was okay to go to her home and to get directions to the home. So here we share some of the implementation challenges. Remember that 60% of the mothers are not disclosed the HIV status. And therefore we had to be very creative to maintain confidentiality. So this is a um, quotation from a lab technologist who arrived at the home and was welcomed by the husband who was, had a lot of questions. It is not common for healthcare workers to do home visits. It does happen, but it's not that common, especially in the COVID environment. And so he had to explain to the husband why he had come. So uh, I will read, allow me to explain to you why we are following your wife. I did not disclose to him that she is HIV positive. I just created my own story. I told him that we followed her home because she did not deliver from Chitavi Clinic, which is where we did the study. And she was discharged without us knowing what packages were given to her and how she was faring. So that is why I am here. So the husband um, accepted and phlebotomy was done for both mother and child. But this shows you the challenges of implementing technologies in real world settings. Secondly, there were some disadvantages for testing before birth because when the mother is in labor, um, drawing blood and reporting results is, is not easy. And so it was better to do the blood draw early in the labor process. So as reported by a research midwife, 
or research. Now, start your procedures maybe when the male has just started labor. Um, for example, when you introduce the IV line and the midwife already knows about the draw, then you can do it at that time. It was more challenging to do it much later on in the labor um, than earlier in, in labor. There are also advantages of testing after birth. Um, because then you can do blood draws in a single interaction with mother and baby. But this, you had to be careful that you did not do it too soon after delivery. So you want a mother to recover and that visitors have come and gone. But you don't want to delay too much that the mother has already been discharged and gone home. So to quote, the mothers have been through a lot of struggling and we want to do the test when the mother is fine. Some mothers have post bleeding was delivery bleeding, some are new mothers, some are just learning how to breastfeed the baby. The babies are also crying. There's a lot that happens after delivering, so the mother should be given some time to rest. 30 or 60 minutes would be a good time to take the mother for point of care value testing. So you can imagine a typical uh, delivery, especially for a new mother. Uh, she's overwhelmed, uh, she's in pain, the baby's crying, her mother and mother-in-law are both there, and now here you are trying to, to draw blood. Uh, so it required some creativity and sensitivity to pull this off. So I'm going to share a summary of the qualitative findings that um, we put into three categories. Um, we looked at how point of care value testing influenced maternal, the mother's ART adherence, how it helped mothers protect them, babies from acquiring HIV, and how mothers felt like it impacted their emotional well-being. For this talk, all photographs have been used with permission. So the first category explores how point of care viral load testing encouraged and improved maternal ART adherence. Mothers viewed point of care viral load testing as life-saving because it encouraged them to take their medication. Quote, I prefer same day results because I can base on the results to save my life. Quote, I decided to take antiretroviral treatment like no man's business because I got scared that if I continue being careless, I may die soon. When you are told that your virus is not suppressed, you know what to do when you go back home. If you have not been adhering well to your drugs, you have to change immediately. This is not the case when you leave hospital without knowing your results. You cannot know if you are not adhering well to your drugs until when you go back for your next visit. So this mother appreciated knowing her results on the same day the blood draw was taken because she immediately could make a plan about how to handle her adherence. Virus suppression is also viewed positive by mothers because it confirmed to them whether the, how well they had been taking their medication and also motivating them to continue if they had been doing well. Quote, I felt good and happy because it felt like as if I had cured myself of HIV. I was strong because I knew that I was adhering well to my drugs and there was no way the results would show otherwise. I did not have any fears at all if they say that whoever has been adhering well to their drugs will be cured from HIV, I will definitely be among those ones. I take my drugs very well. So it was good for her to be told or the viral load result to align with what she already knew about her own adherence. And this was motivating, described by the mother as feeling good and happy. We found that point of care value testing also enabled the healthcare workers to act immediately. As reported by mother, the viral load test is very important because it helps you to know whether you're adhering well to your drugs or not. It also helps the health workers to know if the drugs they're giving you are working well. For example, when I did my third viral load test, I was told that my virus was not suppressed and the health worker decided to change the regimen for me. If the test was not done, the health worker would not have known that the drugs are no longer working well for me. 
Uh, this quote shows us that mothers clearly understood the reason why viral load testing was being done and the implications for finding um, an unsuppressed viral load and how that related to adherence and drug resistance. Uh, so this is encouraging that few clearly understood uh, what was going on. So that is the first category describing how mothers experience viral load testing as influencing their adherence. In the second category, we will explore how point of care viral load testing helped mothers protect their babies from acquiring HIV, as reported by the mothers. Mothers viewed the point of care viral results as reminding them and motivating them to what they call fighting to achieving virus suppression before delivery, as reported by a mother. I got to know about my high viral load results four months before delivery, and I fought to suppress it. If I had taken the other one, meaning standard of care testing, I would have got results when it is one month for me to deliver. So I would have delivered with a whole viral load, which puts the baby at risk of getting HIV. I wouldn't have known, and I wouldn't have reacted the way I reacted. The other thing is the joy of having an HIV negative child. I was scared to miss that joy because they brought my first baby on earth when it is negative and I was happy. So I thought about that joy and I said, I should take ART to avoid transmitting HIV to my unborn baby. So here the, the strong motivation is delivering an HIV negative child. He has gone through that experience once already. She was very happy about it. And now she's very motivated to do it for the second baby because her viral load was detectable uh, four months before delivery. Point of care viral load results also gave women the information they needed to decide what to do regarding their baby's health. Quote, learning the results on the same day is best for me because I get to know if I can infect the child or not when I'm pregnant. And this also uh, related to breastfeeding. The mother could decide uh, what to do. Um, we also found in, in our other interviews that the midwives are also helped with they knew that the mother had detectable viral load if they needed to do any invasive procedures, that they, would, they already had that information. Although we're supposed to do universal precautions, you know what sometimes happens in busy labor wards. It's helpful to know who has a detectable viral load. And so, as I just said, our point of care viral load results influence mothers who decide whether they are going to breastfeed or not. So, quote, once you have the results, then you can decide whether to breastfeed the child or not. It was the reason why I asked to have my viral load tested immediately I gave birth. There was no way I could put my child at a risk of breastfeeding when I know that my viral load is high. The chance of the baby getting HIV would be high, but now I started breastfeeding when I'm comfortable that my baby will not get HIV from me since my viral load was suppressed. At the time I was thinking about protecting my baby and that is why I asked for viral load testing so that I decide well. And the common thread here is that the motivation for taking treatment is so strong and protect the babies from getting HIV it's almost like it's even stronger than their own health, as um, would be expected from a mother. So knowing their results is a very strong motivator um, for them to suppress and not to infect the babies. So second category, how point of care viral load testing uh, influence mothers. And so now we move on to the third category and how mothers said that this intervention improved their well-being, emotional well-being. So women perceived that, that knowing the results on the same day reduced the anxiety and what the agony from waiting until their next visit to get the viral load results. Quote, I prefer receiving my results the same day. When you go to hospital while sick, you expect to be told what is disturbing you. This is sick for other with other illnesses. 
when you go back without knowing, it stresses you a lot and you cannot settle without knowing what is disturbing you. It is important for one to know because it helps you to know what to do next. When you are not told whether your viral load is suppressed or not, you keep wondering what the results will be. Whereas if you know the results, you go back home knowing whether you'll continue adhering well or improve adherence if you have not been adhering well. So the mother describes an immediate uh, feedback loop where she knows her results and knows I'm doing well, let me continue, or I am not doing well, let me do better. But clearly, the anxiety of not knowing is something that she describes in this quotation. They also acknowledge that the waiting for results was stressful and created uncertainty. I prefer the one where I get my results immediately because it soothes your heart. The viral load test where you have to get the results on your next visit is not good because you're always worried about the results that you'll be given. You always wonder what the health workers will tell you when the viral load is not suppressed. You are always looking at the phone to see if maybe a healthcare worker will call you and when he or she calls, you still wonder what the healthcare worker will tell you. Living in fear is not good at all. I'd rather get my results immediately than wait. And I think we can all relate to the anxiety of waiting for um, a, a test result or news and you're looking at the phone wondering, uh, has this person called? Maybe I missed the call and the anxiety of, of waiting for the unknown. And so it is powerful to hear mother saying, uh, getting the results immediately soothes her heart. Um, women also described the toll that waiting had on their health. For example, one said you even get high blood pressure and they felt that stress would not be good for their health. You will be worried all the time and even felt to take your pills well. And so when they were able to take away this stress, it made them feel happy. Um, it makes me happy because I do not worry about that all the time for the standard viral load test. I could spend much time worried thinking, I wonder what the results will be like. I wonder what the viral load is. And yet remember that the more you worry, the more your CD4 count lowers. Yet for the quick test, when you learn the results quickly, it makes you happy. So again, clearly, um, same day results are perceived as being better for one's own emotional well-being and having to wait for results and and spending three months for your next quarterly visit in that state of anxiety. So to, to summarize the qualitative results, women of only preferred knowing the results same day over the standard uh, testing algorithm. From the qualitative quotes, we can see that women understood the purpose of viral testing and the relationship between adherence and virus suppression. They knew that if they took their drugs well, the virus would, quote, go to sleep. Receiving results on the same dose of motivated women to continue doing adhering well to treatment, particularly to protect their babies. And they valued receiving viral testing during pregnancy and delivery and during breastfeeding to protect their babies from HIV. I think this came out really strongly in the qualitative data. So to summarize, uh, we did a pilot randomized trial of 151 women Overall, 83% had postpartum viral suppression. There's no difference by randomization arm in this small sample. The median detectable viral load was 225 copies per meal. And 48% uh, of women had not disclosed their status by the end of the study. This was a decrease from 60% at the beginning, 48% at the end. And I think we're all familiar with the reasons why women choose not to disclose. Most of it is fear of abandonment, fear of economic support, fear of what the man will do if he finds out. It's mostly fear. Point of care viral load testing eliminated waiting time for results. It encouraged women to take their meds well. They said it reduced their stress levels and it helped them to decide what to do regarding infant feeding. And we learned that doing this during COVID that you have to be flexible. The ideal is always doing the viral test same day and delivery 
but sometimes women deliver elsewhere and you have to be flexible and respect their confidentiality above all. So what are the implications of our finding for, uh, for implementation? I think that point of care value testing and early infant diagnosis complements centralized testing. We have a well-established centralized testing, but there are gaps that could be benefit from having um, this, this, this uh, technology available. And that this could be integrated into national diagnostic testing networks, for example, for hard to reach areas or for underserved populations where we're not getting coverage of early infant diagnosis like we would. And it also helps with task shifting uh, as we move towards differentiated service delivery. So I view it as a complement to, to centralized testing. Um, it facilitates faster diagnosis and treatment of babies who may have HIV, and that improves um, the well-being of children and reduces uh, preventable deaths from, from HIV. I would like to thank the study participants and our research midwives shown here, a study team, including peer mothers uh, who are living with HIV, uh, research midwives, and uh, for, for this, we were cutting cake to celebrate successful, uh, achieving successful uh, enrollment into the study. And two of the midwives are on this call and we help with answering questions. We are thankful to the National Institute of Mental Health for supporting this work. I'd like to thank Gwyn and Dipti, our colleagues in South Africa, for supporting um, us with uh, the Gene Expert platform and, and cartridges. All right. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to uh, the Q&A uh, with my colleagues on the call. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Andrew, uh, for that insightful presentation. So we'll go to question and answers. And I just wanted you to put into context uh, where that facility is in Uganda, oh, yes. because Uganda is known to have a very good centralized system. Yes. Uh, for delivery of a specimen to the lab and for a quick turnaround time of results. Over. Thank you. The Kitabi Health Center is in the western suburbs of Kampala. Um, it's a health center three. So our primary health centers are health centers one to four. And then the district hospitals being the secondary level of care and the regional and the national fire hospitals being the tertiary levels of care. That's where the, the, the study was done a typical primary health care facility on the outskirts of Kampala. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there is a question from Jonathan, and it is related to your sample size. Yes. Uh, saying, uh, he's asking what would be the ideal sample size for you to see a difference? And uh, as you conducted the study, were there patients who preferred a point of care uh, over standard of care and were there vice versa opinions? That's a great question. Uh, part of the reason we don't did, I think we didn't see a difference is that we already have very high levels of virus suppression in antenatal care. In uh, the larger study we did where we had 500 women, uh, we did not see a difference either in virus suppression. When everybody is above 90%, it, you're going to require thousands of women to see a difference in viral load suppression. So it's a good problem to have that we have high levels of virus suppression. I think as we do the last mile towards ending AIDS, what we need to do is use such technologies to find those last remaining people who are not suppressed and use these technologies to promote them. Although the centralized system works well, we just need to use this one to fill in the gaps. So 151, we didn't see a difference. We didn't see a difference in 500, 100, 1,000 of women to detect a difference. And that I don't think is what we need to use these resources for. I think we just need to use them for addressing the remaining gaps. Thank you. Yeah, there's another question about uh, the cost analysis. Uh, yes. cost. So Abala and Caroline want to know if this was conducted. Yes, that's a great point. We are doing cost effectiveness for a, a different study. So I can't give you cost um, data for this one yet. Um, um, I've, fortunately, I don't have those data at the moment. We're still doing the analysis. Okay. So, uh, Mariamo 
uh, from Mozambique also uh, acknowledges the good results you have received in this facility. But she's asking, are these results replicable in a large hospital and uh, where there are many mothers delivering? And would, would you be able to deliver same day results in such a setting? Over. That's a great question. Um, a lot of work has been done in South Africa um, on same day viral testing, very busy Johannesburg hospitals. And so this has been shown to be, you can do it in busy hospitals. Of course, it's challenging um, with a crowded labor ward, how to maintain confidentiality, how to, especially with the relatives crowding around as we do. So ours is not sure that it can be done in a busy hospital. That has already been shown. Ours is to show whether it can motivate virus suppression. Um, I would like to ask my colleagues, I think Faith, you're on, and Agnes, if you can weigh in, what do you think? You did the study, you were there in the labor wards doing these procedures. What was your experience? Feel free to unmute and, and, and respond. Faith? Let me try to unmute her. Faith, you can go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Andrew and the audience. Yes, uh, for the question that Jonah, uh, the last person asked, yes, I believe this study, this these procedures can be done even in very big, busy hospitals, um, as long as there's swiftness by the staff and the willingness to do the procedures, it can be very uh, well done. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. The next question is from Dr. Pascal. A very nice study. Did you specifically interview women who had a positive viral load? So I've been detectable viral load and were their perceptions different from those who were suppressed? Great question. So we chose women based on whether they had experienced that intervention. We did not stratify by whether it was detectable or undetectable, because it was a very small sample, only 22. And you risk, if you stratify too much, you end up with three or four women in each stratum, and you're not really getting useful qualitative data. It would be helpful to then purposefully sample in a future study based on whether they're detectable or not. Um, but I think from the quotes, you could hear a woman saying um, she was, um, her viral load was high, it, it was unsuppressed and her, reg her regimen was changed based on that. So that is one example of a woman who saw that this intervention helped with her treatment. Okay, so our follow-up question is that uh, beyond the documentation, beyond documenting client certification, sat satisf satisfaction, how many infants do you think you prevented in the case of the point of care app? So extrapolating the data. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very small sample and I was taught in by statistics never to extrapolate beyond the data. And also we remember one third of babies are not tested. So we have that unknown uh, because they were not available uh, during COVID. They had they were out in the villages. So it is hard to know if you're thinking about number needed to treat. This was a very small pilot. So I don't think we can know how many infections we, we prevented. It would be helpful and I would probably give that to the math modelers, but I can't, uh, on the basis of this small data, give you give you a guess. I think that as this is scaled up into larger demonstration projects, we'll be able to, to answer those questions. For now, we can qualitatively tell you that the mother said that they decided whether or not to breastfeed based on their results, but we don't have the sample size or the data ahead in front of us to see how many babies we could have protected. Also, we did not follow beyond three months of postpartum. So this would have been helpful to see if we had followed all mothers out to 18 months, you do the final test and then you can be able to say so many babies are protected. We didn't have the funding to do that kind of study. Okay, just a follow up. You mentioned that infants were tested even though they were few. Mm -hmm. Was it birth testing? And Come again? Was it birth testing? Both. Okay. Great point. Faith, you'd like to take that? Oh, Agnes?
let me see if Agnes can unmute. Agnes, you can go ahead. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? The question is, was this birth testing for the infants? Testing at birth? Yes, was done immediately after the reversal and all within one week. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, you have. So my second question is, what is the algorithm for birth testing in Uganda? Do you do a repeat test at six weeks? Yeah, the national guidelines recommend that the first HIV DNA PCR be done at six weeks. And then the second at nine months, respective of uh, uh, feeding status. And then the third one, when after weaning, and then the final antibody test at 18 months. So mm -hmm. testing at delivery is not standard of care. It is something we are doing, we did as part of this research study. The first test is done at six weeks postpartum. Okay. So there's children, the infants got a second test. Correct, a standard of care. But remember, we only followed up to three months, so we don't know what happened. We don't have the data for the, 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 the PCR test. We only have the data we collected from point of care. We could go into the records and look that up and see how they compare, but we haven't done that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Geoffrey Kumwenda is asking, would there be any difference in viral load or, or the time it will take to achieve undetectable viral load levels? between women who disclosed their results to partners or family versus those who chose not to, if the husband was supportive? Oh, this is a big one. And we did a whole clinical trial on this one. Um, so we've known for many years that men are not engaged in, in PMTCT and, or in, in antenatal care in general. And we have spent two decades trying to get men to test and to support their wives because women who have not disclosed tend to hide their medication uh, because they fear the men finding out. So we did a, a, a large randomized trial, 500 women, uh, whose results we are just about to publish. And we actually found no difference in viral suppression between women who disclosed and those who didn't. And it would appear that women are quite smart and they're able to, to, to continue adhering even when they have not disclosed. There are instances where the man will find her medication in her handbag and then trouble ensues. But most of the time we, we find that women are able to manage non-disclosure. That's why we have such high rates of non-disclosure, at least in our sample, 60% at, at enrollment and 48% at baseline. And so, um, Faith, what, what are your thoughts? Um, you, you did both trials. Um, what are your thoughts about disclosure and virus suppression? Great. Yes, I'm on. Um, thank you. Uh, like Dr. Andrew said, uh, we didn't see any differences between the two arms that for the other big studies that we've done uh, for reasons that uh, mothers, irrespective of support from their partner, they continue to take their medication. So we didn't see any difference there uh, in, in disclosure. Yeah, right. so disclosure remains something we encourage, but I've gotten to the point where I think that maybe we shouldn't push it too hard. Let the woman decide. She knows her man better and her circumstances better. If she wants to disclose, let us support her. If she doesn't want to, let's respect her autonomy. Thank you. Okay, thanks. There's a follow-up question from Dr. Pascal. Mm -hmm. and She says, I understand that your primary outcome measure is separation but one would like to see an outcome measure documenting the gain in timely correct decision for breastfeeding in those not suppressed for point of care versus standard of care. Can you elaborate on how you determine that? Yeah, great points. Um, the study was not designed to answer those questions. It's a really small pilot. Um, it was only about 42, 43 women in, in each, each randomization arm. So that would be ideal, but I don't think we have the, the numbers to, to, to inform that. 
Um, I would like to see that kind of thing done in a larger trial where you, you which is designed to answer that question. It would be very helpful for the field. Do you intend to have such a trial as a follow-up to this? To answer some Great of question. This? Yeah, if we can get funding for it, the challenge is getting the funding. Okay. Uh, Nuwagira Obed wants to know what the sample type uh, was used for POC. What type of sample was used for the uh, POC, viral load Great. and also EID? Excellent. Faith, what did you do? What type of sample are you drawing? Were you drawing plasma? What were you drawing? Yes, we use plasma. Okay. For both yes. for both EID and viral load. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Jonathan is asking uh, for someone to comment on the sensitivity and specificity of the point of care you used and what the reference test is. Is that question for Cephid? Or Dr. Andrew, you have somebody who can answer that. Yeah, I'd, I'm an epidemiologist. I, I don't speak lab and I wouldn't want to comment on behalf of the company. So maybe Rumbi can comment. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know, for example, about the reference testing. Okay, uh, so another question is, at the beginning you said that uh, the, the, only about two thirds of infants actually get a test by two months. In your view, what is the greatest hurdle for, for us to achieve the target of 100% at two months? Great point. Um, these are data from the Uganda AIDS Commission uh, that were reported just before COVID. So things may be a little different after COVID. Um, and there are people from the Uganda Ministry of Health on here who have better insight into this. I think the challenge is, is that at six weeks, some, I mean, there are various challenges. Sometimes samples are taken. Sometimes there's samples are, are spoiled on arrival at the lab. Sometimes results are received back at the facility, but the mother doesn't show up to receive them. Sometimes they are misplaced within the facility. I guess there are various reasons why our coverage is not higher than, say, 70%. Um, but I would let Faith weigh in, since you're the midwife on the ground. Why do you think that we don't have higher coverage of early infant diagnosis? Or anyone from the Ministry of Health can jump in. Yes, uh, in addition to what Dr. Andrew has said, I think the other reasons are some others uh, take long to come back to the health facilities. So for the two months, it's not achievable because some others are lost to follow up. By the time they come in, the first sample wasn't taken off. Yeah, and the rest of the reasons that he said, samples get lost, sample quality, and others. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your answer. Uh, Richard Muanika is asking uh, if there is an aspect that assess the confidence in results by the mothers who had prior access to the conventional sample referral system compared to point of care viral load uh, testing. So if you want to take that one, you're the one who's giving the results. How did mothers feel when you gave them to have our load versus the standard lab testing? Well, since the point of care viral load results uh, came in immediately when the mother was still in on the ward, the mothers really received the results very well. Uh, the feeling and the joy they had was really expressional. They were very happy and grateful to the staff, the company, which they hadn't even met, but you could see really the joy the mother had when you give her the results immediately for her child. So yeah, there is nothing that I can replace the joy the mother had with anything. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a question from Asteria and she's asking 
if you monitored patients to see if there was adherence to treatment or non-adherence. What do you do when the patient becomes resistant to their medi medication? So were there some, did you monitor that and were there some interventions that you put in place to promote adherence during the study? It was a small pilot with so a visit at delivery and a follow-up visit three months postpartum. So we didn't follow long enough to monitor that. I think I read a quote from a mother who, as I said, had uh, drug resistance and had her and had her um, treatment changed. M women continued with, with their standard of care uh, through the public health care system, and that would have been caught there, but we didn't, we had such a short period of follow-up, so we were not able to do that. We could have used this influence treatment if we had followed up for longer, but we didn't have those resources. Okay, thanks. I have a follow-up question on, on your results and your perception of the study. Mm. Uh, you used mothers who were over 18 years. Mm -hmm. Know that there are challenges for those teenagers. Yes. Do so you think uh, you'd be able to achieve same results uh, if you had teenage mothers and also in non-pregnant, uh, uh, non-pregnant ladies and gents? A great question, and this is a the the last mile. So where we. This would be helpful for last mile where we know we have struggled with adolescent adherence and bar suppression for, for, for decades. So one in four Ugandan teenagers will become pregnant or have a child by the age of 19. And one of the challenges we have is many of our studies begin enrollment at 18 years and older. We need to do better, including adolescents, mothers, especially after COVID, we had such a high spike in teenage pregnancy because people were locked in. And so future studies should include adolescent mothers since our national guidelines allow people older than 14 and older to consent independently if they're pregnant. So this would be a great example of a population to include in such a study to see how point of care value testing would motivate the adherence because they are one, young, two, bio, bio, uh, neurobiologically immature and therefore struggle with adherence. Three are often in unstable relationships with older men. Four have higher um, prevalence of um, intimate partner violence. And five are twice as likely to have HIV infected babies as women. So women, mothers younger than 25 in Uganda are twice as likely to have infants with HIV as mothers older than 25. So from a, a national perspective, that tells you that mothers younger than 25, we have to do a better job of, protect, of preventing a vertical transmission. Thank you, Dr. So that is one of the populations our target for this. Okay. Sorry, there are many questions because it's an interesting topic. So I think we'll have the last two before we wind up. So you briefly mentioned another part of the study about getting males as yes, well. Men. Getting males is also an issue. Mm. You say something about that and if it could be an avenue to get more men to come to the facilities? Men, men, men. We have struggled with men. African men in general um, test less, uh, start treatment at lower rates, and achieve viral suppression uh, less often than women. Uh, PMTCT programs across Africa have struggled to engage men. In, in the Kampala area, we have about 30% uh, male engagement in PMTCT. We did a large randomized trial, which increased that to 47% of men engaged, and another small pilot study where we're able to get 62% of men testing because we used peers. The bottom line is men do not want to come to facilities that are predominantly women focused. They don't feel comfortable. And for men, HIV testing is, they fear it because it, they said it will uncover their promiscuity and their multiple partners. And so we are now designing an, yet another randomized trial to say whether we can do community HIV testing for men to get them to engage. But it is a really difficult area we've struggled with over the past six years. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, the last question is from Leo Mungata and mm -hmm. is asking, what was your major challenge during the study? Ah, 
there are so many. It was done during COVID. We're struggling with importation of the gene expert and cartridges because of customs delays. Um, just the, the difficulty of doing it, transport restrictions, you needed a permit to go around during COVID, finding mothers up country who had relocated. Uh, Faith, you would like to jump into some of the challenges you faced on the ground? Yes, confidentiality was one of the major ones. Uh, of course, if a mother hasn't disclosed, she wouldn't want you to go to her home if she delivered mm. from a different facility and transport, like you said, uh, and all the other uh, challenges that happen in facilities. Yeah, electricity cut off. Um, I mean, there were many. <laughs> For example, you would load the cartridges and then power would go off. And so you've lost that run and you have to rerun the samples. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks uh, for the questions and uh, the engaging audience. And uh, uh, Dr. Andrew, thank you for answering the questions and faith. And uh, I give you a chance now to say your last word or your concluding remarks before we make some announcements. Thank you, Collins, for excellent moderation. Thank you, Faith and Agnes, for being on the call. And thank you for being such an attentive audience and asking really excellent questions, some of which you don't have answers for, but uh, ideas for future research. I think that we have gaps uh, to eliminating viral vertical transmission. And if we're at end age before 2030, we need to plug these gaps, especially for adolescent mothers in our countries. Thank you. Thank you as well, and we look forward to uh, getting your results on uh, how to bring men back to facility. So that we'll be on the lookout for that. Uh, for the audience, uh, you can download your certificates using that code. You go to our website, uh, aslm.org courses, and then you can download. We also have our uh, biannual uh, ASLM conference. Uh, this year it takes place between December 12th and 15th, and the deadline for submitting abstracts is 31st of July this month. It will take place in Cape Town. So please send your abstracts. Otherwise, I do have a good day, good afternoon, and good evening. Bye.